بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم everybody um, welcome to uh, ISBCC before we um, start just a few few announcements the first announcement is um, it's difficult to make one of our dear um, brothers um, Omar Sadiqi who some of you know had leukemia and uh, the leukemia has returned so ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him patience inshallah to cure him and to make it a means of his kafara he has a, a Facebook wall um, if you're interested you can write you know it's an, like an Omar foundation a very beloved brother that used to be here like all the time in the masjid physician very talented, gifted person. So, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make things easy for him, inshallah. Inshallah, tonight, um, as you know, we've had a number of people who um, have accepted Islam in the community. And um, the power of, of the prophetic light, even in this age where Islam is really being maligned by its own people. I mean, it's one thing to be maligned by Abdul Maher, it's another thing when you know you couldn't hire a worse media consultant than what we already have, right? Um, unfortunately at different levels but still um, through all of that you find that you know the light of the Prophet is very intense, very strong and, and when it casts its, itself into hearts hearts are moved. So tonight um, one of the dear, one of our more recent brothers and, and my mother um, used to talk about people like Hector and say, you know, Hector's good people. You know, Hector's good people, which means, you know, it's a good man. Uh, brother Hector is uh, one of our beloved brothers in the community who really um, exemplifies the attitude of a Muslim. He accepts Islam and immediately begins to volunteer, he, you know, work in the community and be part of, of a broader process. So tonight I've asked him to share with you, um, I've heard the story before, a very powerful story of his journey uh, to Islam. And it's very important to hear these stories, not so that we can feel, oh wow, compared to this person. No, but just to see that within all of the negativity, you know, there's still a lot of very powerful energy for good in the world that guides hearts. So. Uh, Ready to go? Fadda. Yeah, you can go right now. Yeah, go right now. Go right now. Of course. Um, so it's a very dear brother, and he's going to share with you. Uh, probably grab this one. His experience, um, and it's a very powerful, alhamdulillah, very beautiful narrative. Fadda. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm sure some of y'all already heard my story. But a little quick summary. Um, I come from a family that is mostly Catholics and Jehovah Witness. And uh, I've attended a few churches and whatnot and it never really was for me. I never felt moved in any type of way. I used to find it weird that people used to say that they had the Holy Ghost and they would start dancing and going crazy. And me and my sister would never understand that. But uh, so, my mom basically raised us by herself. We lived in, we'll say poverty. Came from basically living in the hood. And I ended up joining a gang about the age of 13, 14. I would say I probably did that as far as like I was soul searching or looking for something that I couldn't find in religion at the time or I couldn't find at home at the time. Even though, you know, God bless my mom, she gave her all to raise us as good and best as she could. So, uh, I went down the life of gangbanging, ended up doing a lot of bad things, a lot of things that I live to regret. But I wouldn't change them for the world because I don't think I would be here sitting before you today. But I uh, started gangbanging, started dealing drugs. And eventually it all caught up to me and I ended up getting incarcerated for two years. And the whole time I was in jail, 
every cellmate I had was Muslim. So Islam was always around me. And, uh, you know, the first thing I felt like I know about Islam was they're all terrorists. Let's just be realistic. Because that's what the media fed us since kids growing up. But I always said to myself, I would probably end up being Muslim before anything else. And I would, I would always have that thought, but I would never know why. I just felt it deep down. Because like, I have a theory. I don't think you find religion. I think religion finds you. So when I was in jail, I started reading a little bit of the Quran. I started reading a little bit of the Christian Bible. And certain things that were in the Bible didn't make sense to me or even add up. And a Muslim brother that was in there told me, when you're reading the Bible, find the place where Jesus says, I am God and worship me. And uh, as I was reading the red letters in the Bible, I never found that. So to me, you know, even if that was, even if that is the one lie in the whole Holy Bible, the fact that there is one lie in it makes me not even want to have nothing to do with that. And so I started reading the Quran and a lot of it made sense and a lot of it made facts. So I get out, I get out of jail from serving my two years. And uh, I kind of go back into the same lifestyle. I'm working, still partying, drinking, going crazy. And deep down in my heart, I never felt that peace. And one day, I Googled like a mosque, and then this mosque came up. And uh, this very same day, my friends, I made plans with them to drink after I got out of work. We were going to go grab a bottle and get twisted in the block. So. It's funny enough that when I get out of the when I get out of work and I'm taking a train um, home, I uh, I don't know I, I can't explain it, but I didn't end up drinking. I didn't end up going to chill with my friends. I ended up here, and that very same day I took my shahada. And it's I, I it's just I can't explain it. It's just when you know deep down that you're home. That's like the most wonderful feeling ever. I love everything about Islam and I love being a Muslim and I wouldn't trade it for the world no matter what they say on TV because I've been around good people and I've been blessed to have very good Muslim friends. So that's, that's basically it. That's my story. Wait, one minute. Let me get some candy. <laughs> or do you want the gummy bears? The gummy They're from bears. Turkey. No, 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 no. They're imported. Turkey gummy bears is the best thing. No, this is not Turkey. It's from Turkey. Oh, oh, oh. It's not Turkey flavored. I'll take this. No, I mean you can give the gummy bears back to me if you don't. You sure? I mean you can give them back. What? We can trade. The, actually, those are Turkey flavored, bro. <laughs> Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad, Sayyidina al-awwaleen wa al-akhirin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma salli wa barak wa salam alayhi fi al-awwaleen wa fi al-akhirin. So alhamdulillah, that was, um, he held back a little bit. I'm going to get the remix version. It's Friday night, you're supposed to rock the remix. Um, but um, all the lace, uh, uh, you know, still very powerful, um, alhamdulillah. So as I mentioned, we need to make a special dua for um, Brother Omar. Uh, Siddiqui, who is a beloved friend of a lot of us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cure him, inshallah. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate um, this very d difficult time that he's going through. Um, so we're going to do a little something different than what we've been doing just based on um, the reaction to the Friday uh, sermon. It was so excited that there was even an intermission, right, <laughs> during the khutbah. Um, and that is that we were talking about what happened last week, for those of you who are aware of Bill Maher, right, it's an Arabic name. Um, he's Maher, yani, which is very intelligent and erudite. Um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts, those of you who have been following the debate, um, and I'm going to ask some questions and then hopefully you'll interact um, and share your responses. Um, but initially, just to uh, get everyone up to speed, I talked about basically four things in the khutbah. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, I'll do that as we continue. Um, but of course the khutbah is not the time to, you know, 
deconstruct and look at contemporary liberalism and where it is as a philosophy and ideology. That's, that's a long discussion. Um, but my approach was to note that there is a prophetic remedy for dealing with these kind of challenges. And this is a challenge of rhetoric. The Muslim community in America has to become fully aware of the danger that confronts it at a rhetoric level, how it's being portrayed um, at a broader level, and there needs to be a stake in that, that we need to be able to start thinking at a higher level and a more invested level and a more sophisticated level um, than what, what we find today. And there's a number of reasons for, for that not happening. One of them is just pure history. It takes time for communities to learn. Every religious community in America has had its nightmares. Um, Christianity has had to deal with slavery as a history in America. Judaism has its own challenges. Catholicism has had its own challenges. And all of them were able to stake a claim in America in some way, shape, or form, which helped kind of blot out some of the negative associations that people have with those religions. Whereas right now, according to some studies, we haven't been able to blot out the negativity that is associated with really a very incredible community, a very dynamic community, one of the wealthiest communities, religious communities in America, one of the most diverse communities in America. And it's interesting to note that um, with all of the challenge of patriarchy in the Muslim world, just today or yesterday, you know, a 17-year-old Muslim girl from Pakistan wins the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, so the assertions of Bill Maher, um, there's actually a fact check website you can see where a number of his assertions were incorrect, but at a da more dangerous level was invoking liberalism as a universal and that we are able to deconstruct and devalue any other ideology through the lens of liberalism as, cl as claimed by him. In fact, liberals responded and said that actually is counter to liberal principles, right? Becoming completely intolerant in the name of liberalism is kind of like a double entendre, if you will. It's like the walking dead. Um, the second point that I made was that oftentimes, and I received a number of criticisms from people, um, even on Fox News last week, you know, attacking me, saying like, why do you care? Like, who cares? Just like, leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, so what they, they say things, things about us, and that's what the individual who interrupted the khutbah was saying. You know, who cares about what people think about us? Like, we just follow Quran and Sunnah, and, and everything will be fine. So, the point that I made is that if you look historically through the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, you will see a constant effort to make sure that his character and his social rhetoric, if you, you know, take the tipping point for it as an example, Whenever the Prophet's character was challenged, it's one of the times where the Qur'an never delayed its revelation. Like whenever someone said something about his character, immediately a verse would come to defend his character. Sallallahu Before he was a Prophet, his character was well established. People trusted him. He was Amin. Trust, being trusted is a key to prophetic, the office of prophecy. If you're not trusted, you can't hold that office. It's just how it is. You can't be Nabi before you're Amin. You have to be Amin and you have to walk through that process and then you are able to speak from a religious voice. The second issue that I mentioned is that the Prophet himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on more than a number of occasions took into consideration how Muslims were seen and how he was viewed Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you know, for example, in Mecca, he wasn't allowed to immediately make the da'wah. The da'wah was delayed. He wasn't allowed to preach to people immediately. There was a process. Um, in Medina, on a number of occasions, the Prophet ﷺ actually said that he would not do things out of consideration for how it was seen by other people. Like rebuilding the Kaaba on the foundations of Ibrahim. He said, I'm not going to do that. I'm worried about the people of Mecca, how they'll perceive it. When Umar ibn Khattab wanted to discipline someone who was rebellious uh, with the Prophet the Prophet said, do you want people to say that the Prophet kills his companions? He's worried about a broader rhetoric. Uh, one of the reasons for, for, for Mu'allafat al-Qulub in Surah Al-Tawbah that you give zakat even to non-Muslims, right, is to create a sense of love in the hearts. 
and a feeling of mu'allafa actually means like soft-heartedness towards the Muslims. So we see that through certain religious acts as well as the actions of the Prophet I'm not going to go through all of the things I mentioned, it's online. We see that definitely he's concerned about the portrayal of Muslims. We see that Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu salam inna la naraka min al-muhsineen like we see that you're a good person. It's very important to be seen in that way and carry himself in that way. And then in the second khutbah, you know, the three points um, that were made is first and foremost that in this discussion, in this discussion that we've seen, and, and, and this is important for you people here tonight to think about because most of you are young, um, there's a very strange logic to this discussion. And it was actually used against me on Fox News by my boo, um, Megyn Kelly. And that is, and, yeah, exactly. And that is that, not really. Um, that is that Islam in America will be judged, but we're not part of the control group or the other group. We're not part, we're not a variable in this equation. We're, we, we receive the, the judgment, but what's invoked are things overseas constantly. So you won't find like pundits quoting like American Muslim communities, good or bad. They will say that we don't denounce terror, like that's the general thing, like Muslim Americans don't denounce terror. Like, we're all supposed to just stand up one day, walk outside of our houses, and say that we all denounce terror. Nothing would change, right? Um, but the fact is, when you read all of the articles or you watch what's happening on the CNN or Fox, it's always ISIS, um, it's always somebody was maimed in a country, someone's humanity was violated, FGM is invoked, um, and so on and so forth. And then it's our fault as American Muslims. And, and what I said in the khutbah is that until we create an American Muslim identity and an American Muslim community to the point that that community creates a rhetoric that is understood by the broader community, we will continue to be defined in this way. People are not going to see us for really what we are as a community. Um, one of the city council women in Boston Two years ago, she came and she visited, she toured the mosque, she met sisters, ate some samosas, you know, and she said to me, like, you people are incredible, but like, no one knows about you. The uh, producer from CNN that I worked with before, before Pierce Morgan, Pierce Morgan got, that's another, Morgan and Megan, got dropped, you know, she hang out, hung out with us for like a day or two. She like kicked it. And, and she stopped me in the street and grabbed me and said, your community is incredible. Like the Muslim community is dope. And she was like, the theology is like, it's fly. Like really, she spoke in her language and then she said, but no one knows about you. You don't have, and she said, you need like a Muslim Rick Warren. Like you need a Muslim T.D. Jakes. You need like a Muslim Joel Olstein. You need a Muslim Cornell West. Right, you need a Muslim Maya Angelou. That's our Clara Muhammad, right? You need voices that speak to people in a way that they understand. She said, because it's beautiful. Like, it's a very beautiful thing. But it's just lost in translation somehow. So the point that I made in, in the second part of the khutbah, and, and I wasn't able to elaborate on it because of time, is that the American Muslim identity has been developed in a way that may not be very healthy for us or healthy to others. And this is what Reza Aslan talked about in his, 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 his op-ed in the, in the New York Times a few days ago. And that is if you look at the trajectory of how Islam established itself, and, and this is the trajectory of all religions. You know, if, if, you, if you're a traditionalist Muslim, I would really encourage you to read the history of the Catholic Church versus modernity. It's exactly the same type of discourse. It's the exact type of discourse. I mean, the Pope in 1912 or 1914, you know, he actually has what's called the modernist papers where he just lambasts modernity in favor of a pre-industrial age, pre-modern construction of Catholicism, more or less. And that's what you find now in our community, to certain, certain people like that. 
um, you find generational power invoked, right? So the closer you are to this generation or the more, re more you represent that generation in certain avenues of your life, somehow that's meant to give you authority. So you have like a Salafi school of thought, which is really invoking like generational authority, right? Of course, we give authority to the Prophet Sallallahu but the issues of ijtihad need to stay ijtihadat after him. So what has happened is Islam, at least in my experience as a convert, um, in, in living in different states, St. Louis, I lived in Missouri, Detroit, you know, California, Massachusetts, Oklahoma, in different Muslim communities, there's one theme that I saw at least in the early days, and that's the theme of authority. That it's an authoritative kind of expression. And, and that's rooted in, in a quest for orthodoxy, right? No doubt all of us want to be as orthodox, quote unquote, as we can be, as long as that makes sense. But when you read what the classical scholars wrote about orthodoxy, it was never this authoritative, very power-based message. It was like, just believe in the Hadith of Jibreel and you're good. You know, just believe in the Hadith of Jibreel and you're okay. And, and in fact, one of my teachers, Sheikh Shankiti, I translated this fatwa, it's online, many years ago. He said that really, that's all a Muslim is asked to do. Look at Imam Razi. Imam Razi, when he died, he said, He said, man, I wish I would have just died like on the creed of the simple woman in the village. Like, I studied all these things and it it's like it started to bother me to a point that I became a doubter. So there has been this need for authoritative expression, whether it's vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, other religions, right? Which is sometimes, of course, healthy. We need to state who we are and what we believe. But I think we can do it in a language that's not necessarily a power-based language. Whether it's political, so you find in Masajid that, and, and, and this is, is a theory that I'm working on, the social construction of Islam in America, you know, the politics are very power-oriented. Right? So all of us who've lived in, except here, mashallah, every mosque I've ever lived in, I dreaded the election season. You know what I'm talking about? Like, when you like uncles disappear for a week or two, it's like, it's like Brody from Homeland. Like, you don't know where they're sleeping, where they are, something's going on. There's like backdoor politics. You go to beautiful Masajid in America, and they're empty, and you hear about there was like this hostile takeover, right, through the elections. I remember I lived in a community where they were actually faking addresses. You know how people change school districts? They were doing that so they could get their friends to vote and get people out. So there's this power dynamic that pushes people away. So there's a theological authority that we find. Then there is a ritual authority also. And that's where people come into Masajid and they themselves might not look a certain way, might not have a certain type of style, and people will come to them and basically check them. And they will feel empowered to check them based on Amr bin Ma'roof, but if you were to ask them about what are the conditions, and we studied that in this class here uh, five or six months ago, what are the conditions of inviting to the good and forbidding the evil, they will not have any idea. It's a power discourse. It's a power discourse. Um, so I, I would say that if we're looking at how Islam is functioning in America, the initial birth of Islam, and even through the nation of Islam, it was a very powerful, authoritative discourse. It made sense at that time. But as we begin to function within the parameters of America, maybe there are other aspects of Islam that we should focus on more. For example, the pastoral aspect of Islam is never talked about. How the Prophet ﷺ dealt with people who sought God. How the Prophet ﷺ engaged people who struggled. How the Prophet ﷺ allowed the Christians of Najran to pray in his masjid. That is not a message of power. No doubt there is an authoritative strand even found in the tradition of Islam. Especially vis-a-vis -vis the Crusades, it exists. And even in our sacred text, because there was a state that was being ran by the Prophet ﷺ in Medina that had to have authority. But as Ash-Shatabi mentions in Muwafaqat, is that Medinan model best for every place and every time. What do you think? I'm asking you the question. I'm the audience, you're the sheikh. Right? Do you think that constantly invoking maybe an authoritative discourse? So even with converts, right? When converts speak, you know, I like to hear a convert accept Islam not because of another religion's faults, but because of the truth. 
It's a very different thing. Like I, I became like I became Muslim because of Islam. Like I was motivated by Islam as a truthful narrative to me. Like that's what pulled me into the deen. That was what was beautiful about his story. That it's something that pulled me in without having necessarily to be hypercritical of something else. But again, the need to feel authenticated or the need to feel authority can be problematic. And the Prophet ﷺ said that there are two things that are more dangerous to a person than two wolves let amongst sheep. One of them is the desire for authority with religion. Someone seeks this authority. So I would suggest that as Islam grows in America, and this may shock you, and let me be careful because it's a discussion, that maybe the introduction of theology as the initial point of conversation is problematic. Because theology in this country tends to make people upset. It tends to create division. And I did not become Muslim through theology. I became Muslim through marijuana. I'm not saying also you go and give people marijuana. I'm saying my friend and I were fellow partners in crime. And he was Muslim. I didn't know he was Muslim. And I humanized him before I knew he was Muslim. So when he told me that he was Muslim, you know, I remember I went home and I told my mom, I was like, he doesn't believe in Jesus. Like, he doesn't believe in God. He's a Muslim. But he's like, it's my friend. So I knew him as Daryl, right, before Ahmed. And that's really what set the stage. So there are some people maybe who theology is a great avenue to be introduced to them, but there are others who may be brought into Islam through other means, or at least develop a friendlier attitude towards Islam through other means. So what are your thoughts on the authoritative history? And we find it now still in many communities, even with imams. You know, I remember once I was with some imams, and I'm not free of this mistake either, by the way, so I'll blame myself. I remember once I was with a group of imams, and it was a Q&A session, and one of them, he was like, who are these people to ask me questions? These people are juhala. He's like, these people are ignorant. I, I should be the one who just teaches. They shouldn't ask me questions, right? So there's this authority, there's this need to feel authorized. So my question to you is, the first point is, do you think that an authoritative approach exists? And if it does exist, is it healthy? The second question is this, and what you're going to do, you're going to talk with each other for like two minutes. It's going to be tough tonight, right? So get nervous. So number one, it's okay, let him play, it's good, mashallah. This is his house, alhamdulillah. We don't need to begin to teach him about authority. And by the way, Angry Birds, it's in Arabic. You know the first Angry Birds? You know what the bird says? al hiquni which means save me or grab me. My daughter, Taki Masriya, and she told me, Baba, al-ta'ir bi al You know, the bird is saying, save me. I was like, oh my God, it's in Arabic, right? So you Arabs should get some money for that. But, so the question is, do you think that there is an authoritative, um, and this, this falls also within even the religious leadership of the community. Some authority is healthy, of course, right? To a certain degree, there needs to be organization. And then secondly, has that been good or bad for the community? And with the other communities that are out there, what Riza talked about. And then the third piece is, what would be an alternative model? So instead of maybe authoritative Islam, there could be pastoral Islam. I gave you an example earlier. So I'm going to give you two or three minutes to talk it out. And then I'm going to ask you to respond, inshallah. And if you respond well, I have, this is Stumptown Coffee. You know, this is like organic direct trade. It's not even fair trade, dude. This is direct trade. That means someone went and bought it from the guy. I'm just joking. But this is uh, um, from Costa Rica. So if you answer well, you're going to get some beans. Fadbal. Give you two or three minutes. Bismillah. Bismillah. Yalla, 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 yalla. Good. So let's, let's get this party started. So as for the first question, and I want you to feel free to express yourself, okay? 
we don't, we don't necessarily need the typical answers because those aren't going to motivate and stimulate thought and conversation. Um, so the first question is, do you think that there is a authoritative ethos? Ethos means, right, <laughs> philosophy, attitude, right, in our community that affects policy. Adam. And we're talking about the American Muslim community now. So authority without being authoritative, how do you do that? So Adam said that we should have authority, sorry, I'm, I'm more Adam, um, but without it being authoritative. So my question to him was, how do you do that? That's a million dollar question.
she's invoking a hadith, man ra'a min hum munkar al fadi ghayru fiya. Whoever sees an evil should change it with their hands. But let's be very careful. And that's why one of the first things that I taught when I came here was the 40 hadith. Because of this hadith, where, you know, there's about 17 conditions to acting on that hadith. One of them is ma'akta mafasid wa masai. Like, if you think it's going to create a greater harm, then you should probably not do it. Um, so the hadith is not a license to become minhayat al amr wa ma'ruf al munkar. It's a license to actually become educated about the psychology and methods of dealing with people. But that does touch another point that we also can't just become ethically irrelevant. So how do you balance that, right? You, 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 no, because I know what you guys can say. No, I love you. I love you. You know, I love you. I love you guys. But I was listening to what you were saying earlier. And I'm not, not going to do it, man. Look, hey, man. I won't give you the coffee, but you're not quite there yet. All right. Um, <laughs> And I have a study or two, okay? So I understood what you were saying. Um, so, you know, Niebuhr, everyone should read Niebuhr, especially if you're interested in how religion works in America. Um, you know, he talks about, interesting enough, one of the, the criticisms of some of the, some Jewish scholars of what they felt were the teachings of Christ. Many of us would see them as Paul's teaching was that they made it like everything's fine, there's no problems, you can do what you want to do, God is love and mercy. So they felt that those teachings actually made religious ethically relevant to me. That's another issue. So again, your point is not that how do you find, how do you find that balance between correcting maybe evil, but doing it in a way that doesn't necessarily have a negative impact on people. Right? Yes.
So someone took the time to build you and, and inspire you and not demean you. That's very profound. Beautiful. That was really powerful. So the other question was then, uh, and uh, let's look at this for example, Malcolm. Uh, when Malcolm was asked about the numbers of Muslims in America, he would not go up. He would say, I don't know, and if I knew, I wouldn't tell you. Whereas, I remember in 1993, 94, you know, people were saying on news like there's 25 million Muslims, there's 14 million Muslims, there's 17 million Muslims. We gloat about our numbers, right? That's why I'm talking about this need to feel important constantly. Um, where Malcolm was clever enough to say, I don't know, just a few. Right? And, and this is the point I'm trying to touch on that sometimes the ethos of authority can cause us not to be strategic and not to think through things well. The other problem with that is that it makes us apathetic. So you'll find us not really appreciating the moment now. Um, Islamophobia in this country is really reaching a very strange, um, very well calculated, well thought out, um, very highly. Uh, highly invested, people have invested tremendous amounts of money in Islamophobia, and we just think everything's cool, because we're like the chosen woman. We're fine. And, and that is a problem, because when, when that leads to apathy, and that's why I quoted al who we've been reading, when he says that if hope leads to apathy, then hope is a delusion. You know, if hope leads to apathy, it's delusion. And that's why the Apostles said that the one who is ignorant is, is uh, the one who is intelligent is the one who amina about the most, is the one who acts for what's going to happen after death and trust in Allah. And the ignorant person is the one who just, you know, I leave it to Allah, the most one called right to find my first read is all good. You know, look at uh, in the Quran, say that Maryam alayhi salam, akhru bil You know, when she's pregnant, she said, well, who do you think she's not, you know, she, Allah asked her to, like, move a tree, like, who can move a tree, let alone when they're going through pains of labor? But she's asked to try to do, to put forth something. Our community, for some reason, you find a tremendous amount of apathy on issues, like Homeland, like, I actually watched Homeland, I'm on season three now, that, that girl carried around to be crazy about it. I'm not saying that to be patriarchal, Brady got his own issues, but wow. Um, but there is no other religious community that would let that happen. It's the most bigoted show on television. And today we saw in the chuppah, the response to the brother who interrupted the chuppah, was like, this doesn't really matter, man. Who cares? Who cares what people think about us? That is concern when the sense of self-empowerment and self-authority causes me to become apathetic and unaware of very, very serious serious challenges to our communities. So the, sec the second question then was, what's the alternative? What do you think is an alternative model that, it, you know, Sheikh Zakir al-Ansari, rahimahullah, he said that the Prophet is an ocean that has no ending. So like, there's aspects of the Prophet that are very pastoral. There's aspects of the Prophet that are dealing with social justice issues. There's aspects of the Prophet that deal with ilahiyyat. Theology. There's aspects of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that deal with, you know, education, and so on and so forth. Ali Akhtar Salat was Salat was Sistine. So out of that wahr of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it seems to me that the authoritative aspect of that ocean may not be the best for our current situation. So what would you propose as an alternative? Or if you think, you know, that's the best, please share why. That was the second. If I can remember these questions, these are all freestyle you, I mean, I was thinking about it all day. Um, then you should be able to answer that. Are there alternatives to an authoritative or authoritarian um, or a discourse rooted in power? And when you look at the Crusades historically, you see how Muslim writers wrote, it was a language of power. Post-colonial Muslim scholars wrote in a language of power. It makes sense because of where they were historically, right? The Sahaba wrote, well, talked, and what was, you know, collected from the Sahaba was a language of preserving something. Their concern is preserving what 
was left, Imam Malik rahimahullah, is like the last one of that era who is concerned with preserving a model. So we have the actions of the people of Medina uh, in our method, alhamdulillah. Yes, I saw someone pass their hands up. Yes, ma'am.
except for like a mahta in Tunis, uh, and the brothers in Turkey, uh, and then of course Morsi, uh, the legitimate president of Egypt. Um, outside of that, in general, you'll find a common theme amongst these groups. And that's the establishment of religion. Dark heaven. Reminds each and every one of us of our potential. 
we stop this competition about uncovering certain things about, like, you know, my man, we were talking to in my office, you know, you've only been Muslim for a while, and we were saying, like, you know, there's things I can do now I never thought I could do before. There's things I uncovered about myself, like, I never thought I could have that. I never thought I would be that way. So the Prophet saw a lot, right? because Allah is a passion. Allah is the one who uncovers. So you, you're, you're, there are aspects of each of our personalities that we will uncover by trying to emulate him. And we discover our potential through him. He constantly screams at us to achieve our potential by emulating the best. Now they say if you want to get in shape, live with people that are in shape. It's a study, it's interesting, right? If you want to get out of shape, live with people who are out of shape. If you want to be successful, hang around successful people. So if you want to achieve like a prophetic level of ethics and worship and standards, there's the person that you need to emulate. So the last point, and that's where I think that authoritative language is problematic, where we are sometimes intimidated by the Prophet, which is natural because it's the Prophet. Alayhi Abba Salatu Salam wa Tasneem. But the Sahaba were motivated to uncover their potential. There were people who sought to discover things about themselves. And that's why in, in Jannah, you know, when people enter Jannah, what would they say? They say, Alhamdulillahi hadana ilaha. You know, they will say, Alhamdulillah, for the one who guided us to this, because if it wasn't for him, Allah, we would have never discovered this about ourselves. We would have never achieved this. We would never have reached this place in our life. We raise what we want. So the last piece that uh, I touched on was that, and there's one more point, sorry, and that is, that really we need to look at our relationship with our Prophet and with the body of sacred text as the acquisition of attention and discovering things about ourselves morally and ethically. And that's, that's what makes conversion a little bit different, right? Because when you convert, you're, you're really going through like a set of experiences, like you're learning and you're practicing and you're living and, and you, you, know, you let things go, right? I think you know, in the first week you become like a faqih when you convert because like you, you discover a lot of things you're doing you just have to deal with. And you have to replace them with other things. And there's this beauty of the, the initial phases of conversion of, of a thirst for discovery of potential. The last thing is about Dracula. It's not a very good movie. Okay? Even the brain tree. Wasn't very good. Um, but as many of you know about the article that um, a very dear, dear soul brother, brother Shifty Zeman, um, who of course is Patan, my name is Shifty Zeman, um, very good friend of mine in Houston, Texas, Hanbali, proper Hanbali, um, wrote an article in 2010 about Dracula. I don't know if you've read this article. And you know how Dracula actually was, his brother named Raudu al Wasim. You know, in, in English, it's you know, Raudu the Handsome. What do you do? The Handsome. And you know, they were raised by the Atraq. And their father was put into power by the Turks. And, and their father was so thankful to the Turks, this is the true narrative, that he, he sent his sons to be educated by the Turks. And the younger son converted to Islam, who became, you know, Vlad the Empire. He obviously didn't really speak Islam, but he had an Islamic background. And his brother, Radu, killed him because he was oppressing the people of the area. It's not like the movie, it's untold, it's, it's pretty bad. The point is, why didn't we make that movie? Like, that's the point. And, and that's what I touched on today. I'm not saying you and I may stay here. But as a community, if we do not begin to develop our own, and I talked about this earlier tonight, American identity. And that's what I meant by American Islam. People attack me. What is American Islam? American Islam means respect.
respect for the fundamentals, but in those areas will be coloring with the, the, the culture, cultures of this country in order to facilitate people understanding this religion. That's what I meant by that. I didn't mean, the people got nervous. Again, it's the authoritative disease. When I said American somehow, oh, he wants to change your religion, he's gonna, you know, turn it on his head. I mean, I'm not that powerful, first of all. I'm not like, you know, Gandalf or something. And then I live in the North End, I don't see the Concord, so wherever. And then the second, the second piece is that, where is my personal hungry and eat? Like having a good suspicion of the Muslim. And then thirdly, is that that in itself terrifies not only some of the irrational conservatives in the Muslim community, but people on the far right, Islam folks. Because their message is that Islam cannot function in this country. Just as their message is that Islam cannot function in this country. And they actually, you know, we say it longer. They have some shared actual uh, philosophical albums. My question is this, you know, should these men send that out as a screenplay to a lot of people and no one can speak in your song? People that have that type of potential, have that type of potential. So now, the story of Dracula is being told. I saw this crazy movie last night, to where now he's a hero. Dracula has become a hero because he kills Muslims. I mean, that's really the, the underlying, you know, theme of the movie is, in any other situation, this blood-sucking lunatic would be what he is. But because he's fighting the Atar to save his country, he became a hero. So the point is this. If we do not begin to invest ourselves theologically and institutionally in the narrative of this country, we will continually be defining what's happening overseas, which is a problem for us because we have no say in what happens overseas. I remember once there was a sheikh of mine who said something insane on, on, on a satellite television and a uh, program, and then it was translated into English and you know spread all over the place. So we sent an imam to see him overseas and say, like, yo. You have to like fix it. Like, it's the problem. And he was like, I don't, I don't really know what's going on over there, man. Like, I got problems here. Like, I got my peeps. Like, I have to worry about Muslims in my country. You need to worry about Muslims in your country. That's what he said to them. And it was bitter, it hurt, and it was painful, but it was a telling reality that if we don't invest ourselves, speaking to the problems and realities of this place, like Ferguson and other places, and inject what Islam has to say about it, we are going to be continually defined by people who might justifiably so not have this place as their first kind of concern. That's natural. That's natural. So here, the movie's made. It's actually our story. We didn't make the movie. Someone else makes the movie with a third richest religious community in America. We're not a poor community. And there you have it. Of course, how powerful could that have been the actual true story that is written by Shibli at the time um, was put out there. I put that article out yesterday on Facebook. In less than 20 minutes, I had 3,000 shares. Not all those people are Muslim. Right? Not all, I had people contacting me like, like that is so incredible. I never knew this. I never knew this, that you guys are like this. You know? Because we have been constantly dehumanized by certain aspects of the media as well as a, a message that we have no control. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have concern with what's going on overseas, but my point is this. If we don't have strong institutions in America, then we will continue to be mediocre, not only serving ourselves, but we don't have that voice where we can stop what happened at the start of American Muslim issue. We got played again. We got set up. <laughs> you know, we got set up and there's nothing you can do about it. The governor's speech, the night before I get removed, why? Nobody knows who now. And, and the point was, it wasn't Imam Khalid Mehdi, we would have all left to see up there with the Imam Farouk, it wasn't Sister Malika, it was someone who actually we don't even know. And the point is, we don't have hope in that sense. And, and that's, that's what the point is. 
that the way we're trying to achieve authority doesn't bring authority. The way to bring authority is through serving society as a public citizen.
you know, uh, the point of excellence, you know, stop here. And I apologize if people want to read, but sometimes they just need to press out the laundry. Um, I had a sister today, uh, I've known her since my MSA days, so that's been a while. She has about 150 kids now. And uh, she lives in the Paris, and I'm against her. And um, so she was like, you don't need like a machine. I honestly don't really find what's out there except maybe like my saying I like comes from you know, but it's you know it's an easy to kind of um we see about a, a new star on the right. So uh, no see I don't like that. No, no bro. I like that when I was like three. Um so I actually sent her a song by Usher. <laughs> I said this song called Simple Things from Confession. That's a good song where he says, you know, you bought a brand new Rolex and that's not the time she wants. And, and she was like, wow, who is this? <laughs> it's incredible. Because, you know, the words are talking about it's right in front of you and you can't see it. You know, simple things. You don't appreciate simple things, so you can buy a Rolex box, but that's not the time that she wants. She wants to be with you, like that's more valuable than. And she was like, you know, I just get tired of. And she said, I don't know how to say this, but it's like we're just always saying like a salat wa salam. But she said that's good, but like, like that song, I want my husband to hear this. She said, I, I, I want to know, like I got one of the sisters too, right? <laughs> I got all the collection, but. Um, the point is that excellence blew her away. Then I seen her one by Bieber. Bieber has a song called Pray. Have you ever heard this song? No, listen to the song called Pray by Bieber. I'm serious. Listen to that song. I close my eyes and pray. That's the song. It's about dua. My daughter, my daughter, God bless her, she fat. She, you know, started wearing purple and everything. I said, oh Lord. And then I asked her, like, what? Why do you wear purple? She's like, you didn't know JB. I said, I don't know these people. You know, I actually knew, but I just want to play it off. And then she's like, well, you know, he has some big songs. I was like, what? And then she played this song about Salah. She got me, right? She pulled a jujitsu move on me. But the song is actually really good. So I sent it to the lady to us and check this song about God. And I didn't tell her who it was. It's JB before he changed. This was when he was, you know, chubby and he had like the bowl cut. Not now. No tats. And she said to me, like, who are these people? Is it awakening? Like, well, what move? Is this me music? And I was like, that's just the freaking people. And that's Usher. And she was like, a stuff like No, 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 stuff like that. Before you knew who they were, it's not how you handle it. You know what I mean? It's simple things. It's not confessions. It's simple things. Point is, I, I think we've established a medium of mediocrity when it comes to the arts because of exactly what you said. And I talked about earlier that like, we don't encourage creativity. We don't encourage people to do things differently. And that's a problem. You know, not only did Allah tell Adam to speak, he told the pen to write. So you have Adam, and then you have an inanimate object that's also told to create, to, to, to think for itself. So uh, what I need to do is I'm going to put something on Facebook uh, over the next weekend about what are things we can do to improve ISBCC. Yeah, our office conversation, you know, there's no need for us just to sit around and talk. You know, I hated that when I was getting invited sometimes to these think tanks, and they're like, you know, problems with me. And then you get in there, and then you're like, so we're going to solve the next mission. <laughs> you never get to the solving part. You just get to, like, air your complaint. But then it's like, to actually address them and to think about policy, that doesn't happen. So I'll put something on Facebook in the next you know, 24 hours, asking you a question, and then you respond. And just be open, don't worry. Um, no one's going to turn you in or get upset with you. We need also to embrace, and this is what uh, Abhi talked about, like we should embrace grace. Like, 
criticism is not, is not always a bad thing. Your critic, you know, uh, Imam Muhammad, we said you should love your critic. Because the critic, in al Mahdasi, we'll get to it in this book, we haven't got there yet, talks about how if you're sincere, you can actually benefit from criticism. Even people who are your soul, people who are your adversaries, try to find something to benefit from their criticism. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I encourage you, you know, if you're staying, it's not a lot of people here tonight, alhamdulillah, you just um, you meet someone you don't know, introduce yourself, send them out of here, and you have a lot of students, man, people get lonely. Boston is a very lonely city. I don't think people realize it. it's cute, it's charming, but it's a lonely city too. Um, so if you see someone that you've never met before, you know, introduce yourself. You get to know each other, part of all people, some Allah about it. Is the machine artist here? Can you guys see? Don't you have a Oh man. So I thought I have those two ice cream. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the So, what I call the people, Salaam Alaikum. Next week we'll start again with the uh, book.